background and how I, where I came from. Uh, originally, um, I was an engineer working in microwaves and video displays. And about 37 years ago, I came out from the East Coast where I worked uh, in Long Island to wonderful Silicon Valley. Uh, I was probably one of the first field application engineers used by Fairchild. And my primary job was to go around and help clients with engineering problems, design, and applications of semiconductor products. Uh, in those early days, one of the first guys I met, oddly enough, was a guy by the name of Al Alcorn, who was the father of Palm. And I remember in the early days that Al, Nolan Bush, and a guy named Ted Dabney, had formed a company called Syzygy. That's S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. And Syzygy, uh, the first development was a Pong game that they dedicated as a coin-op game. And they put it in a pizza parlor and beer hall on El Camino in Sunnyvale. And lo and behold, it overflowed with coins. At the same time, I was working on a project to build a device which is a coin-operated game that used a microprocessor. A lot of people in the industry swore that a microprocessor couldn't be used in video games, and I knew better. So I accepted the challenge and went out to design one. The name of the game was called Demolition Derby. And some of the unique features of it is that we actually had what we call a coin defeat mode, which was a way of timing the coin as it went through the switch closure to make sure kids didn't use slugs or wire to trip the switch down the machine. We actually had timed the window and had it programmable that this slot time would be maintained in order for the machine to be activated. We also made controls for it that were optically encoded. Here to four before they were contact switches, they were pots, and the idea was to use optically encoded devices because they were more rigorous and could stand dirt, dust, and in harsh environment. About that time, uh, I finished the machine. I was working full time for Fairchild, and they contacted me and had a company they were working with called Alpex that was doing something in the same order with the 8080 process. I was enlisted as like a secret agent to work with Alpex in developing it to work with the F8 microprocessor, which was Fairchild's uh, homegrown processor. Uh, the project turned out we ended up using the software, but I threw the hardware away and with myself and a guy by the name of Gene Landrum, we wrote the business plan to write a uh, division for Fairchild which was to go underneath their watch division to make games. Uh, we finished the whole uh, engineering task in a record time. Me and my guys ended up putting it in production in six months. Our management never understood that that was a record time. And we were considered mavericks because we didn't follow the rules of the game. But if we look back for parallel functions, we'll find that many other developments were maverick. Uh, you had to be a maverick to get things done because traditionally uh, there were people there ready to stick their foot out to say that's not the way it's done, it's done this way. Well, when you break, break new horizons, you have to break some rules. And we were rule breakers. We were known as mavericks, crazy guys. Uh, we did things that were really different. Even uh, the engineering department, we used to have a contest where we would uh, pop the bottle of champagne and see how far the cork would fly and give an award for it. And we had various contributions sometimes Instead of the mechanical one of doing it, our programming guys would do it on, in software on a CRT. Uh, we had one mechanical group actually make tandem rockets to, to blow the cork in this, up in the air, which ended up disastrous when they hit one of the cars in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, 
some of the other things that were a problem is that <coughs> we introduced the thing at the CES show in, uh, I think it was 75. It was an instant hit. Uh, I remember having a booth that was like four feet across that was part of the watch booth and I couldn't even go to the bathroom. I had to make up a sign and have somebody fill in. We even had a crew of uh, people show up that, that did a photograph of the whole thing in a movie that they were going to show in Sweden. Uh, the hand controllers were very unique. The guy that actually made them into a reality was a guy by the name of uh, Nick, Nick Talisper and another guy by the name of uh, Ron Smith, mechanical engineering kind of, kind of guys. And, industrial designer. I made the first uh, model of it, the feasibility study, that it could actually be made. It was here before nobody thought of an eight-way hand controller. You can actually pull it up, push it down, twist right, twist left, tilt back and forth and forward and backward. So it had eight axes of control. In order to make it work properly, we had to simulate, since it was a digital contact, we had to simulate it acting like a analog device in software. And the way we did that was when you touch the contact together first, the movement on the screen of any object would move, would move slow and as it would stay, stay in contact, it would speed up in an exponential function. So you got to play with it and use it almost like it was a pot. Some people didn't know it wasn't a pot. So again, here was the power of the microprocessor being used to simulate other things. Our big problem became with the FCC. We entered into the FCC and we failed. And it was a whole uh, educational advance to work with the FCC. At that time, uh, people like uh, Apple had circumvented getting FCC approval because they didn't have an RF modulator. One of the rules that is unfortunate people didn't realize and, and to uh, <coughs> comply with is even an electric razor can be sanctioned by the FCC. If it radiates any noise of a certain level, the FCC can step in and have you disband that sale of that, that device. The reason why they got involved with us is that anytime you build an RF device that is a little transmitter, in order to get approval, the rest of the circuitry comes into play. And very few people fail because the modulator has problems. They fail because the other electronics comes into their own. And where we were failing was we had uh, a radiation signal coming out of a harmonic frequency that no matter what we did, we couldn't get rid of it. Uh, one of my guys, Will Alexander and I, I remember many times working until we hours in the morning trying to eliminate that signal. And finally, one, I had an epiphany. One day, after working until 2 o'clock in the morning, I went home and I was just bugged by this signal. And I called Will instantly, and Will was still up too. And I said, hey, Will, let's go back to work. I think I found it. And we went back to work, and I said, what is a quarter wavelength of 52.5? megahertz. And he whipped out his calculator and got the half and, uh, what the quarter length of wavelength and length was. I said, okay, now measure the hand controller from the base out to the end, right on the head. I said, uh-huh. He said, we're looking at a spectrum analyzer and we saw the scissors and reached over with a pair of scissors and went clip and went <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we shortened up the hand controllers by two inches. And no more problems. And we took it to the FCC, and the FCC, again, would play games with it because it was a big political razzmatazz to get through them for a while. And we finally got through, and I was sitting in the lobby every day until it passed. I decided, why should I turn around, go back here, and wait? I'm going to sit there. So every morning, I come to the FCC and sit in their lobby. And finally, after three days, the, one of the... Uh, Chief engineers there came out to the lobby and kind of fingered, waved, waved to me and said, here's your number, go home. <laughs> I said, we passed, right? But the big uh, interesting thing about the industry was that many people uh, were sitting in the lobby trying to figure out who the Fairchild guy 